Greetings from Minister Maker Ministries. I'm Dr. Gary Linton, and we're ready in our study for Revelation of Revelation for the Church in Pergamos. Um, let's pray before we uh, begin. Father God, I just pray right now that you would let the unction and anointing of the Holy Ghost to fall upon me. Bring things to my remembrance, what you said to us, God. Show us what you want, Father God. Speak to your people. Encourage them, God. And we're needed. Chastise where needed and challenge where needed. And we just take authority over and bind all the powers of the darkness and every hindering spirit in the name of Jesus right now. Amen. Pergamos was one of the most prominent cities in Asia Minor. Um, located um, in the western part of Asia Minor, 45 miles north of Smyrna, and about 20 miles from the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea. It, it was built on a large or huge uh, rock formation outcropping a natural fortress. It was a city, a, a, a wealthy city with many temples to idols. As we shall see, it was a church of compromise. It was located, it, the glory of the ancient city uh, has vanished but there was a small village just behind it named Bergama. Uh, it was located behind the old city. There's an ancient, there's a, a nominal Christian testimony that has continued to modern times. Now, let's, we're going to go by it verse by verse, phrase by phrase, but I want you to notice. First of all, he says in, in, in verses 12, verse, verse 12, and unto the church, unto the angel of the church in Pergamos, write these things: saith he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. Uh, this was taken from the description in one in chapter one, verse sixteen. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. It was a long spear-like sword. And it no, most probably we represented the word of God. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even and dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints of marrow and is the center of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It spoke of the double nature character of the word of God. It, it, was, it, it brings message of both grace and condemnation for those who accept the message of grace. It cuts the chains of sin and condemnation and bondage which binds helpless sinners. It's the instrument of both death and uh, salvation and death. It was, it shows the power of the word of God. It's sharp. It's got two edges. It will both convict and heal. It will both judge, chastise, and cut the chains of bondage so his people are set free. If you are bound by anything today, I'm here to tell you there's a sharp two-edged sword that Jesus has that can cut the chains of bondage from your life and can set you free under the anointing and unction of the Holy Ghost. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Isaiah 10, 26. There's, there's an anointing on his word. God always anoints his word. That's why I do my best to give as much word as I can because God anoints his word to set the captives free. It can cut the chains of bondage off your life right now in Jesus' name. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Hallelujah to God. The Romans expressed the authority of Roman governors in the terms of the right of the sword. 
And Jesus having the sharp two-edged sword signifies his authority above and beyond that of the Roman governors and government. His authority always supersedes that of the government. We are to obey the powers that be to a point. But when those powers or those laws and government supersedes and overrides the word of God and the authority of God, then we must obey God rather than man. I, Acts 5.29 It's what Peter taught, told um, the leaders of their day when they threatened to not, to not teach anymore in the name of Jesus. He says, whether it's right in sight of God to obey you rather than God, you judge. But we ought to speak the things we've both seen and heard. We ought to obey God rather than man. The Bible does say, let every soul be subject unto the higher power. For there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Romans 13, 1 through 5. As speaking of us obeying the governing authorities, and Paul told, said that under the, under the reign of Nero, who persecuted Christians. But when that authority supersedes the authority of God, then we obey God rather than man. We ought to obey God rather than man. We submit to his authority first and foremost. But it's interesting that it talked about the sword in Romans 13. He beareth not the sword in vain. The sword, the right of the sword of the government is there, the governing authorities, the powers that be, are, are there, is there to, to execute judgment on evildoers. It's there to set boundaries for us, to keep us from overstepping and doing that which we ought not. And if we transgress, then there's condemnation, there's judgment, there's chastisement, there's correction that we will have to submit to. And how much more we submit to his governing authorities. This speaks of the chastisement of God, of God that Jesus carries this sharp two-edged sword to chastise, to bring con corrective discipline to his people and to the church. Hear me, church. Jesus is there to bring corrective discipline. And we're going to see that that's part of what he was doing in the, last, in the second part of this message to the church at Pergamos. Because they had compromised. They had done good in many areas, but, but they had compromised in other areas. Jeremiah 30 verse, 10, 30 verse 14 says, I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy. And with the chastisement of a cruel one for the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. The word of God brings that corrective discipline to the, the one Jesus, the Lord and head of the church, whom we must be subjected to and submit to. For the word of God is quick. And powerful and sharp than a two edged sword, piercing even into the vine and asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints of marrow, and is asunder the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do, or with whom we must give an account. So it's talking about us giving an account to our, of our lives. And submitting to the corrective discipline of the master.
Despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou rebuke him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son he has received. But if you be without chastisement, then are you bastards, illegitimate children, and not sons. So when he's correcting us, that's a good sign. It's not a good sign that he needs to, but it's a good sign that we're still his children. And he gives the admonition in verse 16, Repent, or else I will come quickly and fight with you with the sword of my mouth and fight against them. That's strong words. Oh, God help us. We don't want to be in a position where, we, where the Lord has to fight with us or against us with the sword of his mouth. But sometimes it must be. Sometimes it needs to happen. Sometimes there needs to be corrective discipline. Jesus as a, as a master surgeon takes his scalpel and, and cuts away that which it, 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 the wound in us that is corrupting us, that is harming us to bring ultimate healing into our lives. We must let it have its perfect work. Now, there are four things that Jesus knows concerning the church in Pergamos. And it's interesting to me that there's three things that he says to each church. I know thy works. To him, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And a word to the overcome, a promise to overcomers. He first of all says, I know thy works, and where thou, in verse 13, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not known my faith, uh, hast not denied my faith, even in those days where in Antipas my, was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, notice, he knows their works. I know thy works. This is particularly true when we're laboring for him under adversity and opposition. He knows your labors. What you're doing for him, what you're endeavoring to do with him amid all the opposition of this world and the spiritual attacks coming against you for doing his works, they do not go unnoticed by him. They will not go unchecked. He does not overlook them. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Notice that continue. You have ministered and you do minister. Now notice that the focus is on the ministry to the saints. Saints need to be ministered to first, pastor. And then we go out into the world to reach and minister to the lost. But saints must be ministered to first. In that you have ministered to the saints, not just you've done it, but that you continue to and do minister to the saints. God is not unrighteous. It would be unrighteous for God to overlook your words. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name. Notice you show it towards his name. Therefore, my blood brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as 